Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Lillycrop from ITSMF UK, and I'd like to welcome you to our latest service management forum, Service Automation and CI, Adding Value with AI and Machine Learning. Today, we'll be bringing together a lineup of popular industry experts who'll consider what and when we should uh, be automating and whether we're really driving value creation and continuous improvement in the process. Thank you to Microfocus who are kindly sponsoring today's event. As you can see from your joining details, we'll be starting the session um, with Vaughan Murphy, who will be opening up the topic for us. Then Duncan Watkins will outline Forrester's current research and thinking on automation. After a short break, around 11.05, we'll welcome back Claire Stout, who uh, has been closely involved with BT's impressive work in AI and has spoken about this for us in the past. And then Dean Clayton from our sponsor, Microfocus, will round off with some practical steps in delivering service automation effectively. These events are specifically designed to be interactive and uh, we'll conclude the programme with a panel discussion to allow delegates to share their thoughts and insights. During the presentation, you can post your thoughts and questions in the chat and we'll keep an eye on any emerging themes, um, but also use that to uh, uh, feed the discussion at the end. The session is being recorded uh, and as with many other ITSMF UK events, the proceedings will be shared with other members in the event recording section in our members area. So before handing over to our first speaker, just a couple of things to mention. We have a few other SM forums in the pipeline, some focused specifically on industry sectors, and I'd encourage everyone to keep an eye on the website and social media for further details, which will be coming shortly. Also, just a couple of things on our conference. Our call for speakers is now open. And uh, I really encourage everyone to give some thought to this. Speakers get a free ticket if selected, and you don't need any experience. We have all the support you need. So we really would encourage uh, you to put yourself forward, um, as some of our speakers today have done in the past. It's a, it's a really great experience. Also, our super early bird package for conference is only open until the 31st of January. So please take advantage of the very substantial discount on offer. So that's enough ITSMF commercials. Um, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, uh, a well-known face on the ITSMF UK platform, Vaughan Murphy, who will kick us off on this uh, intriguing and very important subject. Thanks, over to you, Vaughan. Thanks so much, Mark. Give me one second, I'm just gonna share my screen. Brilliant. Can everyone see that? Just a quick sanity check. Thumbs up if you can see it. Not yet. It always works when you test it, Vaughn. It does. <laughs> it's saying I'm screen sharing. I've got the little green message. Let me stop and start again. Okay. It does actually say that you're screen sharing, but then we just see black, strangely enough. How weird. Right. Let's try one more thing. And if not, Mark, you've got my slides. If you're OK to drive, let's just do that. Or I can just chat without the slides. We'll figure this out. OK. Sorry, all. It worked perfectly about two minutes ago. Let's blame oh. me. All right. So it's saying here that I'm, I'm sharing my screen. Can we see my slides? Don't see them at the moment, I'm afraid. Not yet, unfortunately. Yeah, sorry. Okay. So Mark, lovely Mark. Yeah. Would you like to, to share my slides and I'll just chat through them or we can just have a chat uh, rather than uh, keep folks kind of waiting? Um, I don't have them yet, Vaughan. You said you could send them over, but I haven't seen them yet. Okay. Let me resend them to you really quickly. And if they still don't land. Oh, suddenly we see. There we are. They've arrived. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it was a bandwidth thing. Just need to go to a presentation mode. 
Brilliant. There we go. Fantastic. Sorry about that all. So uh, thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, so my session is about delivering value and continual, continual improvement with service automation. Now, I'm the biggest geek in the world and I love automation. You know, IT technology, it fascinates me, love it. Uh, but what I think we need to do is really think you know, how is this going to add value? How is this going to help move our businesses forward? How is this going to help our stakeholders and our end users? You know, just because we can automate something doesn't mean we should jump straight in and automate it without doing the prep work. Uh, so what I really want to get from this session is why automation is important and how to do it in a way that adds value and add, drives continual improvement while supporting our stakeholders, our techies and our end users. So hopefully that's what you've all signed up for in this session. Uh, so a little bit about me, um, super geeky. Uh, I've been in IT forever. I've uh, been in ITSM for about 20 years. Um, as Mark says, love speaking at these events, uh, super passionate. Uh, worked in all sorts of organizations, large and small. Uh, you can see some of the most recent ones on my, uh, on my slide deck. Uh, I'm Irish. Uh, so half the companies you'll see will be from the Republic. Um, I love what I do, uh, genuinely. Um, I love it so much that when I'm not uh, when I'm not being pelted with brightly coloured balls in the name of Vital, uh, when I'm not running around after my three kids, uh, when I'm not doing my full time job. So I'm um, a consultant at a company called I3 Works, uh, currently on assignment with Sovereign Housing Association. Um, I'm an in-house blogger for ITSM Tools. Uh, and I speak at conferences and events like these. I blog, I podcast. Can't really get rid of me. Um, but what I'm trying to get from this slide is that I've been around IT like a, a very long time. And I, I've seen some stuff, guys. Um, I've seen major incidents caused from everything from like really serious kind of terrorist events to squirrels. I've seen things work brilliantly. I've <laughs> seen things tank horribly. Uh, I like to think that very little can shock me, but you know, I've got three kids, so there's that. Um, and I find my job quite fun. So that's me. For those of you that don't know me, let's get on with the show. So lads, the game has changed. Service delivery has changed. Um, the pandemic has accelerated the shift to remote working. You know, lots of us, you know, worked from home maybe a couple of days a week, but I think the norm was still to spend, you know, most of the time in the office. And COVID changed that. You know, I think um, I think we went from, you know, having this like perfect kind of hybrid blend, you know, working in the office sometimes, working from home sometimes to everyone working from home. Like the UK shut down in its entirety. Ireland shut down for, for even longer. Like in Ireland, we could only like stay within five kilometers of our, our houses. Like that's how serious it was. So we had to work remotely, like there was no other choice. And that was a complete shift for our end users. So I was working for a different housing association um, in the UK and the norm was we work from the office, you know, we work together, we work with people, we're strongest together, you know, where we can all bounce ideas, where we can all sit together. It was just what we did. No one really worked from home. And then COVID happened and, and we had to change that. And one of the things that we had to do was really lean into automation because automation, it didn't, it wasn't just about best practice anymore. It wasn't just about it wasn't just about being, you know, doing the best or doing the right thing. It kind of became about survival, about kind of keeping the lights on, like we had to automate. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to keep up with ticket volumes. You know, and I think we found out what was really important. So in my case or in our case, we automated primarily um, so we could continue to look after our users. We automated so that when we had to, to talk to an end user when automation didn't work, when tech didn't work, when all the structures that we put in place like didn't work, that we could still add the most value that we possibly could to our end user community, to our business, to our customers, because the reality of it is that's what it's all about. I think a lot of us struggled uh, more than, uh, than we'd like to admit. I know I think my motto during COVID was keep going, it's grand, but 
her workload tripled, uh, it tripled, and then it quadrupled, and then it became more and more ridiculous as kind of lockdown went on and on. So we automated to survive, to keep, you know, it was more than just keeping the lights on. It was, how do we do the basics? How do we, how do we move forward even during this really challenging time? And what we learned was that automation, I mean, I think for me, people will always be king, but I definitely think that automation has a role. It will improve customer experience without overloading our people. Um, so the eagle-eyed amongst you, um, there's a little picture in the corner of my screen, uh, and that's Moss from um, the IT crowd. I guess that's my kind of attempt to explain kind of service delivery and changing exceptions, expectations even. Um, so when I st started out in IT, IT was in the basement. We're basically in the equivalent of a dungeon of the building, you know, in the dark corners. We weren't allowed out to, to play with the rest of the business. And in this picture, Moss, bless him, he's in the basement. There's a fire and he can't call 999 because, 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 because um, in the IT crowd universe, the government's changed the, the emergency services number from 999 to something really complicated. So there's a fire and he can't call for help. And everyone else is running around the office screaming and flapping. And Moss is sat there living his best life going, don't worry, lads, send an email, be grand. I just think, you know, we need to move, we need to flex. We definitely need automation to, to help us with that. So what's next? Well, let's start with the basics, okay? So what is service automation, okay? So there's lots of definitions out there, some really complicated, but I like keeping things simple. So here we are. So for me, service automation is the delivery of a service in a completely or partially automated matter. That all, that's all it is. You can dress it up however much you like, but that's, that's what automation is. And it's about doing the best for our users and our customers. Um, it's very user centric. The whole point of automation is to make things accessible for our end users, accessible for our techies, accessible for our support teams. OK, but when talking about the end user experience, it's all about the user so they can decide when and how to engage or, or use that service. Um, so typically their mobile app, their web or their AI driven. Um, it's about finding a channel or a delivery mechanism that, you know, the end user or customer can interact with in a way that best suits them. Um, so some real life examples, Amazon, Netflix and Uber, all used in my house. Um, so Amazon, um, you know, I love that, you know, if I if I've forgotten something, because let's be real, um, I have three kids and there's always projects or last minute costumes that they need. So, you know, it's five o'clock at night or, you know, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. I... <laughs> I'm late to reading the school newsletter or it's just a last minute request from the school that they need a costume or a solar system set or something mad for, for school the next day. And uh, I don't fancy dragging all three younglings to the, the shop. You know that I'm going to be asking Alexa to order me something with same day delivery or early morning delivery. Or, you know, I can fire up the app on my phone and engage with Amazon that way. Um, Netflix. I mean, who here among us doesn't have Netflix? Isn't Netflix brilliant? It means that, you know, if my kids are sick or they're tired or we're having a movie day, you know, we don't need to leave the house anymore. We can just chill out and, and Netflix and it's great. Um, and Uber, never again will we be stranded. Fire up the app and someone will come and rescue us. Um, so I know, I know it's traditional. Uh, when we talk about automation, we can talk about what goes wrong. And generally there'll be a picture of the Terminator or Skynet. I'm not going to do that because uh, my kids are terrified of uh, Skynet, Terminator. I've got to admit, um, I am slightly too. Um, that's why I always thank Alexa when I ask her for something, because I think that if a Skynet situation happens, she's going to come for me first because she's sick of being tortured uh, by my kids, all the questions they ask her. Uh, so we're going to lean on the light side, the happy side, the Fridays and the, the Jarvises of the world or at least the, the Tony Stark world in the, uh, in the MCU. So that's automation. Um, what I'm also gonna to talk to you about is something called AITSM. Um, so AITSM 
was a term first coined by Gartner. I think it was about 18 months ago, they started talking about AITSM. And what it is, it's the application of artificial intelligence or AI to service management. And the main objectives, proactive prevention, so kind of proactive kind of maintenance and kind of fault logging and event management, faster restoration of services. We've got a, a Jarvis or a Friday, you know that we're going to be leaning into kind of self-healing technology, self-help technology, all the kind of proactive stuff. So it means that if we have a blip, if something does go wrong, we can restore services, we can get the show back on the road quicker. Rapid in innovation, you know, we're not just kind of limited by, is this particular human having a good day? You know, a bit of AI support, you know, can make the difference between, you know, good and great in terms of innovation. And I love this definition. I think, again, this is from Gartner, a fanatical focus on the employee and the customer experience. Because say it with me, guys, if we're not doing it for our colleagues, for our customers, for our end users, why are we doing it? We shouldn't be doing it if it's not for them. So hopefully that makes sense or kind of shines a light on AITSM. If you've bumped into the acronym before, I thought, what's that about? Uh, so just a little bit more detail, because uh, I'm me and I love getting into the geekiness of it all. Uh, so there are four key aspects or tenets of AITSM. So first up, we've got AI. Um, and that's around kind of correlating kind of historical and diverse information. So allowing for kind of, I guess that kind of data and information kind of gathering and monitoring, kind of using machine learning to really kind of gather the information to help us make the right decisions, uh, help us modernize IT. Then we have the analytics tenants. And what that does, sorry, quick headset tweak, it complements the AI by identifying the best pieces of information, the best pieces of, of information, of data uh, to pull out. You know, what data or information is going to help us fix this issue based on the historical stuff that's, that's happened before? Um, so automation. Uh, so something that's leveraged by the service desk and support teams to perform kind of repeatable actions to fix faults, to fix incidents, to fix problems, to fix, I call them the frequent flyers, um, accurately, rapidly, high volumes to, uh, to free up our support techs for the serious stuff or the important stuff or the stuff that you can't fix by, you know, triggering a workflow or hitting a button. And finally, we have agent intelligence. So this is where I start to get excited. This is about AI and bots, really. So it empowers service desk um, agents by reducing their time to um, time to react for, for complex incidents. Um, it boosts them by providing kind of next best actions for optimal solutions. So if you can't, if the service desk is overloaded, there are kind of preloaded responses, there's AIs, there's chatbots, there's that extra layer of support. We call it tier, you might have heard it being called tier zero support. So that's the non-human support that frees up the humans, for the stuff that, that really needs like a person to sort out whether that's a person at the other end of the, the phone needs, just wants a, a human to talk to because they're done with AI, they're done with apps and chatbots, or because it's just that little bit too hard. But it gives people a choice, it gives people options. And I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think that's what we should be about in IT moving forward. You know, we've, we've done COVID, we've got that out of the way. We need to start focusing on kind of end-to-end -end employee experience, customer experience, user experience. I think giving them options is a really important part of that. I think AI can, can help us with that. Okay, so that's the theory done. Let's talk about why do we need automation? Well, I think collectively, you know, our workloads have increased. Um, you know, I talked about my workload quadrupling during COVID and, you know, you think it would settle down, but it's still high, you know, because we've, we've just found kind of new and, and different challenges to, to lean into now that we have this kind of post pandemic or post COVID environment. You know, now we've got hybrid working. How is that going to work? How do we make it so that, you know, even though everyone's scattered across a combination of home, work, co-working spaces, coffee shops, how do we make the experience seamless for everyone? So our workloads have increased. Um, I was looking at some kind of industry kind of 
um, analysis from uh, the ITSM tools website. So obviously, check out the, uh, the ITSMF website as well, but also check out ITSM tools because there's lots of stuff around best practice, around kind of mental health and around kind of effective ways of working. And one of the things that really struck me, and I can't remember the statistic off the top of my head, was that not only have our workloads continue to you know rise you know folks expect in 2023 going into 2024 that they will continue to rise so we need to be working smarter lads because otherwise we're going to get overrun and no one wants that we don't want our techies to be tired and grumpy and burned out we don't want our customers to have a rubbish experience um we know that you know it's going to be busy so let's lean into automation to try and kind of make it better for everyone um changing customer expectations so amazon netflix uber facebook twitter you know we live in a world of you know always on uh we live in a world of of of, of high availability environments we live in a world of we want it now um, so we need to lean into automation. Now I know none of us have the money of Amazon or Twitter or, or even you know Netflix or Uber, but what we can do is look for the little tweaks. Um, so I've got a friend called Stuart Rance. Uh, you may have heard of him. He's amazing. Uh, does a lot of the ITS, uh, ITSMF, uh, also uh, on the punditry and conference uh, tunnels. He circuits even tunnels. He talks a lot about marginal gains. OK, and this, you know, sometimes continual improvement, it's not the big, flashy, exciting stuff. Sometimes it's the little tweaks that over time can can really have a big impact. OK, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about increased complexity. You know, uh, when I started out in IT, it was basically Novell for kind of joining a network. It was, it was Windows 3.1. That's how old I am, folks. And uh, it was Lotus Notes for email. And obviously the game has changed massively. We have different vendors, we have SaaS, we have all sorts of complexity. Uh, so we need to have a plan for, for managing that and uh, an automation can help. And we need it to free up resources for the important interactions. So getting started, how do we get started for automation? Um, like I said before, don't just automate something for the sake of it. Automate it because it'll make things better. Automate it because it will add value. Automate it because it will fix a pain point. OK, so let's fix pain points. Let's look at the things that, that cause us a lot of pain. So um, I know this is going to be like a, a kind of a theoretical kind of hands up. But we're in January, a couple of weeks um, back after Christmas. Hands up here who normally after the Christmas break, they spend the first maybe day or, or two days sorting out password resets and unlocks. It's a thing, isn't it? People take the two weeks off for Christmas and they, what do they do? Well, if they're like me, they, they cuddle their kids, they watch Christmas movies and they eat quality a street for breakfast. But you have two weeks off, you come back in, you forget your password. So what are the pain points we can alleviate with automation? Password resets, folks. I know I say it all the time, but if you are not automating the password reset process, you are missing a trick. I love talking to other humans at the best of times, but if I've had to sit on an IVR system listening to horrible hold music for 20 minutes to get through to someone to reset my password because I can't do it myself, I'm not going to be happy. Also, account unlocks, uh, multi-factor authentication. Again, I know that's more security, but if you're not doing MFA, you're missing a trick because it makes authentication, it makes you know staying locked down so much easier. Um, deploying software. So again, I know, I know we love a workflow and I know we love approval matrices, but again, this is my plea. If you take nothing else from today, automate password resets and automate kind of software deployments. Okay, build in automation so you can immediately check for licenses. And you know what, if the software or the device or whatever the person is requesting, if it is under a certain threshold, have it automatically deploy. Again, it frees up the end user, they don't need to wait, it frees up the service desk so they can focus on the really techie stuff or the complex stuff or the project stuff or the stuff that's causing real pain. Frees up all the time. So look for small wins, look for things that you think, you know, can this be automated? Um, and don't just focus on IT. 
okay, lean into ESM or enterprise service management. Uh, and for those of you that haven't bumped into that, it is about applying um, ITSM functional fundamentals to the rest of the business. Uh, so things that you could automate, meeting room bookings, um, HR services, so kind of new hires, starters, movers, joiners, leavers, um, health and safety for reporting kind of accidents and kind of near misses, learning and development for requesting uh, training. Okay, the key thing when looking for automation is that it's process driven. So look for process driven tasks with very clearly defined triggers, inputs and outputs. Okay. You want things with very like repeatable kind of steps because the more repeatable it is, the easier it is to automate. Um, so we're gonna talk about some real life examples. Um, so let's start with event management because I think, I think you can't truly be proactive um, until you do kind of event management. Um, so some ideas, you could use automation to notify technical teams by linking services to support teams and using alerting. So use that alerting to set a threshold for when support needs to be called out. So a backup's finished successfully, happy days. No one needs to, to be called out. The network's fallen over, yeah, you're wanna, gonna wanna get the networks team on that. Okay, but by having that threshold, it will differentiate between needing human intervention and being able to fix something um, in an automated way. Um, and this is really important because it will help you cut through the noise. It will make sure that your team only responds to kind of events and alerts that need to be actioned, saving time and effort. Uh, once upon a time in a galaxy far, far away, oh, I used to be a techie that was on call and it's just, yes, sleep is important. So anything that can cut through the noise is a good idea. Um, and again, just a real life kind of practical tip, make sure for the love of all that is holy, that the tool has the correct contact details for each team so they can be notified by text or email in the event of, a, of an alert that they need to, to action. Um, what else do we want to talk about? We want to talk about run books. Um, so run books are, so we talked about thresholds, we talked about notifications, so gotta love a run book. What's a run book? So run books are a compilation of routine procedures for sysadmins and tech teams to manage the systems that they're responsible for. They can be used for onboarding, they can be used for automation, collaboration, they can be used to stop, start, monitor, debug whole IT systems. Uh, they can enable you to configure the system in question to initiate kind of a series of steps. And these are conditional kind of predefined steps to maintain or restore service. So a really cool benefit of Roombooks is that uh, you begin to build an index of routine processes, which makes it easier to add kind of more automation you can build up over time. Um, so some practical kind of real life examples could be data enrichment, could be issuing service notifications or containing threats as part of security response. So incident management, um, we're going to talk about AI, we're going to talk about bots, we're going to talk about chatbots. Um, we're going to talk about gamification um, because, again, these can be game changers um, and it can free up the rest of your team. So use machine learning. Uh, this, can, this is where kind of IT or our tech, it learns from data patterns. And then they're able to make decisions or recommendations. So logging and routing incidents and requests becomes more efficient. Um, so AI machine learning can use analysis of previously logged tickets, user behavior patterns, and predict potential issues, potential stressors, and can reduce faults using self-healing technologies or preempt and fulfill user requests proactively. So for example, if an end user is typing a Toby into the request management um, you know, box, um, you know, the, the tool can say, you know, it looks like you're requesting Adobe, click on this link. We can, you know, we can do the, uh, the license check and deploy automatically all being well. Incident management, we can use bots and virtual agents or even kind of pre-canned texts um, to kind of do the, the routine things like password resets, account on lockout, kind of minor kind of fault fixes. Change, change enablements, one of my favorite idle practices. Uh, so first of all, lean in hard to templates and to models, okay, because templates and models, they'll make things more consistent, uh, they'll make things repeatable, um, they'll make the, the whole platform kind of easier to use. So if it's taking you more than a couple of minutes to raise a change, 
then you're you're doing change enablement wrong. You know, your your form is designed badly, or it's clunky, or or the system isn't as user friendly as it could be. So use models to make things kind of predefined. So it's just a case of selecting the service, collecting selecting the dates, um, selecting kind of any kind of risk information, anything that differentiates differentiates even from the norm and hitting submit. It really should be that simple. Um, so other automated things that we should do for change, um, automated approval, so pre-approved or standard changes. So if we're making, a, um, you know, I know there's a lot of debates at the moment about cabs. I think cabs still have their place, but for the big important stuff that's going to take out the whole services, not for making, you know, network ports live or rebooting dev services. Okay, if you're going to reboot like a bit of network kit that's in a test environment that, you know, nothing is attached to, or you're going to make a network port live, or you're going to reboot a test environment or a test server out of hours when no one's using it, that shouldn't need cab, it shouldn't need complicated approval, make that a, an approved change, a standard change, something that's pre-approved. Same with delegated authority. Now let's trust our techies because they do this kind of inside and out. So if it's under, if the change is under a certain risk threshold, delegate that authority to the tech team and then maybe someone that represents the end user community. So instead of a whole host of approvals, it's just the key people that are involved. Um, links to um, the CMDB if you have it, so that you can automatically see the impact on your change on your overall kind of estate. Uh, release management, look at ways to automate or build automation into your testing, look at DevOps for ideas on kind of continuous integration and continuous deployment, so that you build more flow and feedback loops into your work so that it's a pool based mechanism, you've got that flow. Um, your service catalog, make it actionable, I see so many kind of service catalogs just gathering dust. So make them useful, make them actionable, integrate them with your ITSM tool so that they can be action driven. So that if you're going to check out a service and you think oh, that's great, I'd really like to know more, you can click on it, you can get to know more about it, you can access knowledge articles, you can raise an incident, you can raise a request if you'd like that bit of software, for example, or raise changes. Problem management. I think machine learning could be a real game changer for problem management, particularly uh, proactive problem management, because it's all about kind of trend analysis and machine learning. You know, if we don't do the trend analysis, how do we know what our pain points are? How do we fix them going forward? So they're, they're just some real life examples. Five minutes, please, Vaughn. Awesome, I'm very nearly there. Thanks. Um, I think what I'm trying to get out of this is that we use automation to really build and improve and enhance our service offerings. Um, so I was in a customer meeting a couple of weeks ago and uh, I was trying to explain what I did um, to a very serious um, and very senior uh, member of senior management. And he was asking me about kind of design and transition. And I said, well, look, basically what I'm trying to do is make sure that when we design our services, that they're fit for purpose, they're fit for use. You know, we, they do and behave, you know, like, you know, they're meant to, like, you know, our users have requested and we transition them into kind of live usage in a way that's effective and efficient and safe, you know, so that everyone knows what's expected of them. Everyone knows what's happening and the service is there and it's supported and it's available and we have the right resources in place. And he was still looking at me a bit blankly. I said, you know what? What I'm here to do is to make sure that our services, they're lovely to use and they're lovely to support. That's about it. And I kind of think that it, that applies to automation as well. It's about <laughs> not necessarily saying that everything should be lovely, but let's make things better. Let's make things better for ourselves, for our end users, for our customers. So that's, that's what I'm trying to get to you here. So the benefits, what are the benefits of automation? Um, well, they're leaner, okay? By leaning into automation, um, we make our processes, our workflows, our working practices, the overall kind of, I guess, workflow, leaner and more efficient, okay? It gives organizations the ability to absorb increased volumes. I would love to say, that we'll never have another COVID, that 
everything's happy and lovely again that you know the work volumes they're going to settle down eventually I mean that's my hope <laughs> believe me when I say that is definitely my hope but in case they don't in case we have another blip you know in case things get hard again if we automate or if we even automate some of our stuff we'll be able to give our organizations and our people to be able to absorb that increased work volume in a way that's safe for folks you know to kind of keep um to keep the workload under some semblance of control um, and to look after our people because that's that's what it's all about I, I know the theme is automation but we automate to look after our people um, it gives our service desk analysts our second line our third line our fourth line analysts the time and the space to focus on the serious stuff the hard stuff the complicated stuff that's going to take hours to sort out in the background and also the meaningful interactions that make the world go round during covid um, I became an honorary member of the service desk because I, I stopped doing my job because my job, you know, my job became keeping the lights on, making sure that we could still supply services to end users. And sometimes I'd, sp I'd speak to folks and, you know, they'd be living on their own and they couldn't go out during lockdown. And I would be the only person that they'd spoken to that day. So, you know, let's let's not lose sight of that, too. You know, sometimes it's sometimes even having like a, a five minute chat with someone on the service desk that can that can change someone's day, um, you know, and it's those interactions, I think, that can make the world go around and it improves customer experience. We're up in, we're upping our game. We're making things better. We're making things better for end users. Um, in a sense, we are. We're making our services lovely to use and lovely to support. And that's what it's all about. So that's that's it. Hopefully I've hit my timings. Uh, thank you so much Absolutely. for listening to me. Here's my contact details. If you want to talk to me, if you've got questions, ping me an email, find me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Always about to help. So, Mark, thank you so much for looking after me. Um, sorry about my slides not loading. <laughs> no handing, problem. It, handing back over to you. Excellent, Dawn. Thank you very much. And very good introduction to the subject there, bringing in all your different threads of experience from uh, the various organisations you worked in.